You have to have order. That includes everybody. Excuse me. Did you finish? Now, our first witness this morning is Butch. Butch is a federally protected witness, and in order to protect his safety, no information concerning his present residence or identity is being provided. We appreciate the cooperation of the Department of Justice and the U.S. Marshal Service in making this witness available. Accompanying Butch this morning is Strike Force Attorney David O. Bauer of the Cleveland, Ohio Strike Force. Mr. Bauer has been involved in significant prosecutions of the Hells Angels and has been responsible for assisting Butch in presenting testimony as a government witness. Due to pending cases in which Butch is scheduled to testify, I would ask Mr. Bauer to advise the committee should any questions arise that may not be appropriate for the witness to answer. Where is Mr. Bauer now? Right here, Mr. Thank you. Now, Butch, would you uh, be sworn at this time? Just raise your hand, be sworn. Yes. The evidence you give in this hearing should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes. Uh, Mr. Vita, where are you? If you stand up and be sworn. The testimony you're giving this year should be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Do you have any remarks you want to make this time about the witness? Yes, Senator, I'd briefly like to describe his background if I could for you. Uh, Butch is a 43-year-old member of the Cleveland, Ohio chapter of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Gang. He has been a member of that gang for 14 years. He was a founding member of the Bandito Motorcycle Gang in Texas in 1966. 1967, he left the Banditos and went into the Rod Benders Motorcycle Gang in Florida. From there, he went to the Reapers Motorcycle Gang in Houston, Texas, then back to the Banditos, where he eventually took charge of their Nomad chapter. He left the Banditos and rejoined the Hells Angels in late 1967. In 1968, he helped reestablish the Cleveland's Hells Angels chapter. In 1969, he became vice president of that chapter. In 1970s, he was club sergeant at arms, remaining in that position until 1971, when he pled guilty to manslaughter charges. He was sentenced to a workhouse in Warrenville Heights, Ohio, until his release in 1972. From 1972 until 1981, Butch was actively involved in national runs and other membership affiliations of the Hells Angels. Butch can explain how one becomes a member of and the significance of colors. He can give detailed accounts of crimes committed by motorcycle clubs. He can testify as to the function of old ladies, prospects, and hangarounds. He can tell of territorial disputes as well as social and business affiliations with other biker gangs and organized crime. According to Butch, the book The Godfather was used to reorganize the Hells Angels along the lines of traditional organized crime. Senator, your witness. Thank you. It is necessary for me to go now and open the Senate. I'm going to request the distinguished Senator from Iowa to preside until I return. Now, Senator, if you come around and take the chair. Senator Butch, Senator As a member of this committee, I want to thank um, you very much for your willingness to come and testify because this is a very important hearing and uh, the solutions to some of these problems are very important for an orderly society. I have several questions. As a member of the Hells Angels, did you observe any association by the gang with members of any labor unions? And if so, what was the extent of that association? Uh, 
1978 or nine. We uh, we all got letters from uh, a union official from a local, and uh, that said that we had been working iron for we'd been working uh, iron working for two three years something like that, and we were sent down to Pittsburgh, and uh, we all got German iron working cards and we went to work on the nuclear plant in Perry. Uh, four, there was, four of us got cards, three of us went to work up on the plant, and then uh, there was another card given out in Erie. Where did you get the journeyman's card? From uh, the business agent in uh, Pittsburgh, local, I think it's 818, and we got the letter from uh, the president of uh, local 17 in, in uh, Cleveland. Iron Workers Local 17 from Robert Colombo. Was, uh, was there any security clearance necessary for working at the atomic plant and how did you get that if there was? There was nothing. We just got our card. We got our journalman cards. Two days later we were up on the tower working, <coughs> making scale. How long were you working there? Mm, well, I worked there about a month, a little over a month. The others worked there till the end of the season, okay. did and, you, then, and then worked there when it opened up again. Okay. Uh, did you do anything of a criminal nature while you were working there? I didn't, but the club did something because. Uh, what did the club do? I'm, 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 that I don't know. I wasn't involved in it, but I know there was something done because. Uh, the cards were granted to us for that, okay. as a favor. Why were you given the journeyman's card? For whatever favor it was done to him by the Hells Angels for that local there. I know there was something done. But you stated you didn't know what that was. I didn't know it, no. Okay. Are, are you aware of any uh, counterfeiting operation in those journeyman's cards? Counterfeit journey? No. 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 Okay. No. These these were actual cards then. They were not counterfeit cards. Oh no, these were actual cards. We had to go there and uh, take a little test that we knew all the answers to, and uh, then they asked us which kind of card. The answers were furnished to us by by the BA there. Okay. And for all of the uh, by uh, by who form furnished had, the answers? The business agent there oh. at. Uh, in Pittsburgh, that local 919. Okay. Okay. Uh, we would like to take the names of those individuals involved in closed session at a later time. Please. All right. Okay. Uh, my next question is, have the Hells Angels been used by any labor unions to neutralize any labor grievances? Yes. Uh, all of us had held cards, which at that time there was about seven or eight people there, Hells Angels in Cleveland, held cards. And uh, there was a strike going on. There was a, a non-union non-union job in Geneva, Ohio, <laughs> at the fairgrounds, all right? Is that better? There was a, a non-union job at the fairgrounds out in Geneva, Ohio, Geneva on the lake, near Geneva on the lake. And uh, they were having a big Johnny Cash concert out there. And we were told to go out there and stand near the gate, up close to where all the the non-union people were trying to work over there, and scream and holler at them. And uh, and anything that arose, they would just the union officials would just point us out and say, "Hey, you just go tell the Hell's Angels if you got anything to say." So uh, just and everybody was carrying signs up and down the street and blocking the street. So. Uh, it was over in about an hour or two. They signed an agreement to, did, they would go union. Okay. Did the Hells Angels ever commit any acts of violence on behalf of any traditional organized crime families? Yes. Uh, would you elaborate? Well, in 1977, 
Uh, I know they were taking contracts from the Mafia from different fractions. There was an Italian fraction that was working, uh, the Longshoremen and things like that. And there was a, a war going on between them and uh, the Italian fraction there in Cleveland. And uh, I know that they were taking contracts, hits for the, the Irish fraction side of it. And uh, in 77, one of the members, a Hells Angel member, he was also an intelligence officer there, which I'll get into later. He uh, was setting a bomb on a car that belonged to one of the Italian guys, and the bomb blew up and he was killed. And at that time, the president, we had a meeting and uh, the president uh, was elected to go talk to the, the Italian fraction and tell them that uh, this guy was not in the club at the time that he was killed and, and try to, to keep out of it because we didn't want to get between the two fractions or whatever. And then things were stopped for a couple of years and then uh, it started up again later. The association, but as far as how the contracts. Are how many contract killings were conducted, carried out? Uh, couple that I know of, just a couple that I know of. Uh, at least two. Of, yeah. At least two. Yeah. And that was on behalf of the Mafia against the Irish. Was that on the behalf of the Mafia against the Irish? No, the other way. The other yeah. way. Yeah, the Irish against them. It's Danny Green's fraction against the uh, Nardi fraction. Okay. Right. What is the role of the intelligence officer in the Hells Angels, and what type of intelligence information do the Hells Angels maintain? Intelligence officer was established back in 74, 73, and it was an office to, uh, to gather all the information they could on the outlaws, pagans, any club, any club in the United States, any police officer, any newsman, anybody that the Hells Angels had a grudge against. And they gathered it up from all the different people they know. And Hells Angels know a lot of people, uh, they call them spies. They bring them information on uh, this or that. And they collect all their addresses or anything. And they have a saying in Hells Angels that uh, came out in the paper a long time ago, back in 71 or so, that uh, Hells Angel has a memory like an elephant he never forgets. And that's uh, quite a common saying now. So if they have a, if they have a grievance with somebody, it never ends. Someday, they keep a record of everyone. They keep a record uh, of the person, of uh, families, the whole smear. Addresses, uh, types of cars, what girls they used to go with or whatever. Bike clubs. They, uh, the intelligence officer goes to different towns. He's supplied with money from the treasury for that specific reason from a TCB fund, which is taking care of business. And it's the phrase for it's TCB. And uh, the money from, there's a, everyone's assessed so much money for his TCB fund. And then from this TCB fund, the intelligence officer goes to different towns with another member of the club, either his assistant or he'll send two people from security or whatever, but he's in charge of, uh, of all the information gathering where they'll go rent cars, fly on planes, whatever, motel rooms, whatever, to, to watch a specific club in a town like Chicago, Detroit, Dayton, Florida, whatever, and uh, gather information on them for a hit in the future or whatever. Okay. I, how much money are they assessed? Assessed? At yeah. times we've been assessed 200 sometimes we've been assessed $500 okay. for the TCB. What's the primary source of these funds? The primary source? Yes. You mean from all the members? Yes. <laughs> Drugs, burglaries, whatever they can get their hands on, whatever is convenient at the time yeah. to get that kind of money. And that out. assessment went into this common fund from which the intelligence operation was supported? Yes. Uh, is, that in, is that in addition to dues that every member pays? Yes. So you have regular dues plus special assessments? Yes. And at different times uh, there was... Uh, how, much are, how many dues are there? The dues? The dues are $20 a week. $20 a week. Oh. 
Yeah, do you know the net worth of individual chapters, how much money they might have, everything that would make up a, what we generally call a net worth? That's, that's usually, that's usually uh, pretty well guarded between charters. They don't let each other know in case uh, something comes up, one charter is not assessed more than another charter or whatever, so everybody kind of plays it poor, which normally the whole, every charter, every member plays low profile on money because money always puts everybody out on front street. So on a, uh, they have big money. Uh, so there's no Large problem money. with money. It's just a question of how much uh, effort they have to go to to get it from each member. Is that really? Right. And right. It's, uh, you're saying it's not very voluntarily given up by there's, individual There's members. several millionaires in the club. Several millionaires in yes. the club? Yes. Do you know who the millionaires might be? I mean, can you supply those Howard. names? From top, from them, from everybody. Mm -hmm. from everybody in the club. Well, they have a lot of money. They call them the millionaires. All right. I think you better clarify that. Uh, it may be but better if you let me clarify that. All right. Yeah. Now, to say that you know that I know for a fact that they're millionaires, that is a saying that's in the club. Everyone is proud of uh, say these three members that I'll name. All right. There's one in New York, Howie. Another one in Cleveland, Andy. Another one in Oakland, California, uh, Mike. Mike Primo's restaurant. Is it Mike. Yeah. And everyone is always they call them the millionaires, you know, and they they're to back any any play that's really heavy, any kind of really heavy uh, trials that come down or anything. They always feel that they can fall back on them. But Are they these uh, millionaires involved in legitimate business? No, they mo no, they made most club members uh, in any way. Are these uh, otherwise perfectly legitimate operations? Uh, not that I'm aware of that they're any kind of a crooked thing or anything. Okay. It's just a motorcycle. Well, it's, well, why it's one that's get... read by all. Okay. Well, why did you get a clubs and uh, how could you get a free ad in the in the magazine? Well, there was a Hell's Angel that worked there on the staff at that time. And uh, California's got to, they well, stand close in those people out okay, there. Okay, well, w what if the gang had enough power to place a Hells Angels member on the staff of the magazine? Oh, without a doubt. Uh, wouldn't that be some indication that the magazine then might be a front? Yes, but I couldn't say that they, uh, I couldn't say truthfully that I know for sure that they muscled okay. him in there for that job. Okay. But I know that he did work there for a long time, and that uh, we could get special rates or just any kind of article that we wanted printed there. Now let me continue with some questions I have. Uh, what police officer met you in Florida? No. Not by name. Not by name. Don't call the name. But what? Are you care what position he held? Uh, and I'd like to know if, the, if that police officer was aware of Hell's Angels' criminal activities. He was a high-ranking police official. How's that? He was a high-ranking police official. High-ranking police official? Yes. Now, we may have to go in executive session and, and, and question later just who he was. We won't ask you to call his name now. Now, would you like to go on and tell us more about the investigation in Florida and just exactly what transpired there? Okay. There was two members that had one, they'd quit the club uh, maybe three or four years before. This was in 74. He'd quit maybe 72, something like that, and went down there. His name was Oski, and then there was another one named Shaky that went down there, and they were from the Lowell Mass Charter. Well, two members from the Lowell, two members from the Lowell Mass Charter were sent down there to, to uh, ha there was a new thing that came out that all ex-Hells Angels had to have their tattoos covered completely. 
which at that time they blacked them out with a, a complete black mark over the whole thing. And they were sent down to uh, make sure that they had their tattoos covered. And they didn't take their patches with them or anything. They just went down in regular street clothes. They call it incog. They went down in incog. And uh, while they were there, they were in a motorcycle shop. And the outlaws from this town and uh, the outlaw motorcycle gang came there on them in, while they were in this motorcycle now, shop. The outlaws, the name of the gang, the gang yes, the yes. And um, I'd, I'm no, I'd known these, these same people. They used to be in another club called the uh, uh, Crosses, the Iron Crosses. And uh, from Florida, and I'd met them way back in 65, 66 in Daytona at Ron's when I was back in Banditos and the Reapers. So that's one, one of the reasons I was sent down there too. And uh, so I went down to investigate them. We met at the plane by a couple of detectives taken to the police station. Oh, these, these two people were found, uh, the two members that had went down to investigate to get their tattoos and get them covered up. Uh, they were found killed, they were found uh, shot in the back of the head with a shotgun and one ex-member was found and they were all in a, a pond, some kind of rock pit that's just outside of town and uh, we seen all the autopsies and all the reports and things like that and we went and talked to the outlaws, we set up a meeting with them and then we went and talked to the guy that owned the motorcycle shop. We talked to uh, approximately about 30 people down there. A lot of the people in New York City knew. There's a lot of uh, other old ladies that go down there and live for a while. And there's a lot of drug dealers that they have, they know down there, that Howard knew. So we went around, we talked to about 30 people. And uh, we went to some bars and things like that. All the time we were, we were covered by the policemen. There was a policeman following us around, covering us. Providing and it, protection. Yes. At the meeting with the outlaws, they came with about 15 people. They had people there in the restaurant before that was dressed in cog themselves with guns and things. And uh, The police were given protection for us, to the yes. Hell's Angels. Yes, for uh, me and Howard. Were the Hell's Angels armed at that time, the Hell's uh, weapons? No, not at that time. We, we got guns the next day. And uh, How were they dressed? Hell's Angels clothing or? No, the they were dressed clothing. in cog. They were, no, the policemen were dressed in regular clothes. You know. They were just that, standing, blending in the background. The policemen were dressed in uniforms or they had no, street no, clothes? No, street clothes. In street clothes? Yes. Well, how were Hell's Angels dressed? We were dressed with our colors. We had our patches on and everything. We wore them you down had all the on time. You had your yes. Hell's Angels uniform? Yes. Yes. But the policemen had on civilian clothes and not their uniforms? Right. Uh, they were they were stationed around our motel so that nobody could come there and bomb us in a motel or anything like that. And uh, after we were down there uh, maybe 10 days, well, and we met with the outlaws, and Nolan, he was the president of the outlaws, that uh, they didn't have anything to do with it. We were, we didn't know whether or not they had done it or whether at that time, there was a belief that maybe the police had done it, and uh, they were just trying to start a fraction between us, trying to start something. That's what we were there to determine. And uh, after 10 days or so, we, f we found out that, uh, after talking to many people, that they had done it, that the outlaws had done it, and they talk had done it in their, talk We had found out that they had done it, and they had done it in their clubhouse on a roost that they was going to take them over there and cover their tattoos or something like that. And uh, took him out and shot him in the head. So we left there, and how we went back to New York, I went back to Cleveland, and we reported back that the outlaws had done it. So then they had a big officers meeting, and they declared all out war on the outlaws. And that was in 74. The officers meeting was held in Cleveland. And uh, all what the was charters. the nature of these meetings? Were they formal meetings or just? No, they have an officer's meeting every three months. How's that? They have an officer's meeting every three months. An officer's meeting is from the old, all the East Coast, and there's usually a West Coast representative there. 
but they have officers meetings in California and then and uh, they have them in the east. There's an east coast and a west coast, and Omaha is the borderline. Uh, yeah. Omaha, Omaha is the borderline. Yes. Uh, Everything east of there went on the east coast. Right. West of there went on the west coast. Yes. And uh, the meeting was held in Cleveland, and uh, they decided, all right, we're going to have all of our war against uh, the outlaws. And uh, the war. There was a lot of bombings, a lot of shootings, a lot of killings. Uh, yes, and the war is still going on. It was a cold war there for about a year, but then... Uh, How many people were killed during that year? Uh, it'd be hard for me to say. There's at least 15 that I know of right offhand. I, I okay. could, there's at least 15 that I know of right offhand. I could probably come up with more. From the year 15, what? 1974. Are you speaking about 15 people killed? Yes, just outlaws. Just, outlaws were killed. Yes. There was other people killed How many along Hells at the same Angels? time. How many Hells Angels were killed? Hells Angels? five or six that I'm personally aware of. Five or six Hells Angels were killed. Yes. Now, what brought on this thing? Was it something about removing tattoos or covering the cold tattoos? Yes. Or what's, explain that, the, if you will. No, the, uh, what brought it on was those two members went down to cover up two ex-members' tattoos down in Florida. And the outlaws in Florida killed them, killed the two members and one of the ex-members. Took him out and blew the heads off. Why do you think they did that? Uh, well, the reason they did it was because uh, the, one of those outlaws got into... Uh, Whiskey George was one of the Hells Angels that was killed. And one of the outlaws, his name was Lucifer, he got into Whiskey George's face there, and uh, Whiskey George wouldn't... He wouldn't stand for it, and they started a little fight or something, and he got shot in the leg, and then from there, after they shot him in the leg, they figured uh, they might as well kill him and hide their bodies. Uh, how did they cover the tattoo? Uh, they, the tattoos were started covered at this motorcycle shop, and the guy had just took uh, ink and some needles and had covered up the H and the E. And uh, then when the bodies were found, there was uh, L, L, and I think the S was covered. There was three or four letters more covered. Yeah. 
all Hells Angels have a, a tattoo. It's mandatory. Nine days after you get your patch, you must have your Hells Angel tattoo, and it's all taken from the same stuff. Nine stone. days after you get your patch, you have to have... Nine days. Nine days. Nine days after nine you get... Nine days after mm -hmm. you get your patch, you have to have a... A Hells a Angel tattoo. tattoo. Of, of the words Hells Angels. Hells Angels, the Death Head, and... Uh, the, the what? The Death Head. The which Death Head. Which is the head. center Yeah, I see. The skull with wings. And, uh, and the skull, is all that tattooed? Is all that tattooed uh, of the entire yes. picture of yes. the Hells Angels? Yes, the whole thing is tattooed. The emblem. Hells Angels, the emblem, the MC, and the bottom rocker, whatever state you're from. Some people have it full, a full tattoo on their back, but, uh, but it's required that every member have a tattoo on their on their body somewhere is it done. Some people have it on their back, on their shoulder, some people have it up high on their arm, some low on their arm. They can have it on the arm or the back. It, yeah, it, it's up to the person, wherever they want to put it. Now when they cover it, well then they... Um... Back in 74, back in them times, it was blacked out completely. The whole thing was blacked out. And I personally took a, one member from Oakland that used to be an Ohio member down to a tattoo shop orders from Sonny from California to take him out and cover his tattoo. Now let's go back we to... We blacked uh, it completely out. Let's go back to the Florida situation. Uh, as I understand, the Hells Angels got protection from the police in Florida. Yes. And a high-ranking police officer there was the one that did ne the negotiating with the Hells Angels? Yes. He's still... Is he still a policeman down there? Yes. I'm pretty sure from, uh, I couldn't say right now, I don't know about right now, but I know he was that a couple years ago. That occurred in 19 what? That was in 74. 1974. Yes. Now, how did you make contact with that man, or who made the contact with him? Uh, the president of the New York City Charter made contact with him. President called. of New York City? Yes. Hells Angels? Yes. Made contact with him. <laughs> well, his name's Sandy Alexander. And, and did he have control of other policemen and give them directions? Uh, not that I'm aware of. How's that? Not that I'm aware of. I know there was police chief and, and two or three detectives that was constantly with us, I mean, through that thing down there. The police chief where? In Florida. In Florida. And, the official. Uh, and other policemen were in mm -hmm. constant contact with Hells Angels? Yes. Yes. And now, was that for the purpose of protecting the Hells Angels, or was that for uh, some other purpose? No, they, we were using them for protection, yes. They were protecting us. They were in protecting case anything you. broke out between us and the outlaws. How's that? Because we were in outlaw territory, and, and uh, in case anything broke out between us and the outlaws at the meeting, or, or if they tried to sneak on us at the motel or anything like that, they were protecting us. They helped us lease a car. He helped us. Uh, now, were they acting in good faith from the standpoint of law enforcement, or did they do this because of uh, some arrangement made with the Hells Angels to give them special protection for sums of money or some other purpose? Uh, well, I, I don't know if there was any money changed hands. I know that uh, the guy still, I know uh, in 78, 79, I know the guy was still. Uh, giving information to Sandy in New York City, uh, dealing with the outlaws, you know, of the, how big the club the same was. Same high-ranking police officer in 78 yes, or 79 yes. was still furnishing information to the president of the Hells Angels in New York City. Yes, he would call him for, for any information he needed about Florida. We better not go into that name in open session, I think. Now, going back to the Ohio situation, would you tell us just what protection was received there? from the police? Um, well, I know that this. What they talking about police officers? You know, like Tom Rich doing all that work with the Rich, like the cops are watching and all that. All right. There's a member in Cleveland that's been, uh, he considers himself quite a cat burglar and everything. And he's uh, grown up in a certain part of town. And he's known these police officers on the police force there for a long time. And they set up uh, different house burglaries for him, and uh, 
They've stolen, over the years, they've stolen a lot of uh, riding lawn mowers and things like that. House burglaries where Tommy's, uh, Tommy and uh, a couple other people are freaks behind diamonds and stuff and they go for diamonds and things and like now that. And what year was that or what period This has been going on, this has been going on, I know, from 69 on up till 81 it was going on. It was still 69 going on. 69 to 81? Yeah, Tommy's... The uh, police would set up the situation so that the Hells Angels could make robberies? Yes. And so forth? Yes. Do you know who the police were? I don't want to take that in open session. I just want to know if you know who they were. No, I don't know their names. No, I don't. I don't know their names, no. I don't know their names, no, sir. But did they protect the Hells Angels uh, for any other purpose besides robbers? Uh, yes, uh, you know, what about prostitution, for instance? Uh, no, that's not a big thing there in Cleveland. How's that? That's not a. That's not one of the big things there in Cleveland. I prostitution. See. That's just maybe one or two members. All ladies turn to. Uh, what did they uh, protect the Hell's Angels against, and besides robbers, anything else? Uh, we were always informed of uh, warrants and things like that. Uh, the what? Warrants. We were. We always knew when uh, if there was anybody's house was going to get broken into, or if they were looking for someone, uh, things like that. One... Can I mention This one police officer, uh, the club furnished him with money to give to a witness in a rape case. And uh, he passed the money on who to the Who furnished the money and gave it to The who? Hells Angels. Huh? The Hells Angels gave this policeman the money to give to this witness to buy the witness off in this rape case. And, the uh, Hells Angels gave the money to a police officer to give the witness to buy him off in a rape case. Yes, to buy this girl you off. You know that if you own a call or you just... Uh, yes, he pled guilty to it. Who pled guilty? The police officer. The police officer pled guilty to that. Mm -hmm. well, well, he's been sentenced, I presume. Yes. I see. Are there any other instances uh, in Cleveland that you want to tell us about? Um, I have to think about it. My mind's going to get to her. Fares. Fares, 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 Angels? Yes. You know whether he was compensated for that, was paid for that? I couldn't say that for a fact. I, 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 no, uh... Uh, uh, do you know the police officer? Yeah, I know the, Yeah, I know him. I know him well. And we won't ask you in public who he was. Now... <clears throat> Is there anything else in Ohio that you should bring out? What about all those moms that you didn't want to make the police chief out there? You let us have a free hand in that town. You let us beat up people when they get rowdy or whatever. Don't mention the location. Just say it's someplace else. There's a police station. Yeah. 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 There's a town on the lake outside of Cleveland there that we go to party in all the time over the years. And uh, on certain holidays, there's a lot of people out there, a lot of bike riders out there. This police official uh, let us have a free reign. Uh, as far as beating up people, uh, we beat up a lot of people out there on the street, in the bars and everything else. They would just turn their back and walk away. There's one instance where there was a guy out there with a a Hell's Angel, a phony Hell's Angel patch, and uh, they just stood by and watched us go over and beat him all up and take the patch away from him. And what did they beat him up for? What For, for having why? this phony Hell's Angel patch. There's I been think. incidences where, where people with tattoos, phony Hell's Angel tattoos, have had them cut off their arms. Uh, had the whole hat tattoo just removed with a knife. And, uh, Anybody you call? mean uh, if they had a tattoo, they would just take a knife 
and cut it off and, yes. and cut enough flesh off to get rid of the tattoo yes yes that's happened Do you know what town well, it was, what community it was? Oh, yes. It, yeah, I know that's happened uh, a couple of times. I think once in Omaha, once out in uh, L.A., in, uh, in Cleveland. Um, Do you want to uh, tell us in open session or wait to executive session what town that was? Senator, I think uh, that uh, the witness would prefer to go into executive session. In executive session before we give the name of the town, that would be all right. I let him go ahead. Anything else in Ohio that you'd like to tell us about? Uh, yes. Uh, this guy with this phony patch, this town, we had a free hand out there. We could do anything. Uh, that included uh, drugs out in the open. We could. Uh, Did the police know you were distributing drugs? Yes, uh, well, I don't know if they knew. How's that? They just, they never bothered us. They just stayed away Otherwise, from us completely. Otherwise, the police just stayed hands off and you did yeah, what the town you was ours. We, we controlled the street. If uh, people were racing up and down the street, uh, we'd kind of, we'd stop them for this privilege of taking the town. They would let us have the town for that, uh, for, you know, for stopping people. We more or less governed the town on this, these holidays. And, uh, the Los Angeles more or less governed the town. Yes. Anybody, uh, the Hells Angels don't allow anybody to wear Hells Angels, period. No, wear what? They don't allow any club or anybody to have a Hells Angel patch or the death head with the skull or anything uh, pertaining to Hells Angels. Uh, no one's allowed to have it except a Hells Angel. Uh, nothing similar to it either. Even was there any other place in Ohio where you had such privileges as that with police protection? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Not that I can think of right away. No. Uh, you're speaking about cutting the tattoos off of people's arms. And that includes the backs too. Yes, arms yeah, well, and backs too. Well, I don't know of any instance where there's. And they the would uh, take enough the colors. Yes, they take enough flesh off with a tattoo to remove it. Mm -hmm. And and what did they do with those? What they do with them? Yeah. Just showed them around. A lot of people just uh, you know more or less half at half at uh, tanned it and showed it around, showed it off. I know one guy's kept it. He kept one for a couple of years. Did they take them back to the club and yes, show them just, to the members? Yes. Yes, it was quite a trophy considered. How's that? It was considered quite a trophy. It was considered quite a trophy. Yes. There's only cuttings on the arms. I never heard of anyone getting their back cut off, although I, I did cut an outlaw. Tell us about that. Uh, should say that. About what? In Memphis uh, in uh, 77, Now, did that include cutting trophies yeah. off of uh, outlaws as well as uh, other people who... Yes, I was in tattoos. Memphis in 76, 77, and uh, I was in a tattoo shop getting a tattoo on my arm. A lot of outlaws walked in, and one of the outlaws had a outlaws Memphis on his back with their center logo, and I put 180 stitches in his back with a big X through it. Because, Put 180 uh, stitches in his back. Yes. Was that reported to police? Was there anything ever done about? They tried to catch me, but I got out of town. They tried to catch me, but I got out of town, and the guy didn't file charges. Oh, you charges did on that me. yourself. Yes. Uh, 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 what size piece of flesh did you cut off of him? I didn't cut. I didn't cut it off of him. I just put a great big X in it. Huh? I just put a great big X in it. It's been in magazines. You put a big X on him just to mark mm -hmm. it out? Yes. And uh, why did you do that? What was the purpose? I made him an X member. <laughs> Let's get quiet. Get quiet. Now, is there anything else uh, about the California situation that you'd like to go into concerning the police? Uh, or in a tie between the Hells Angels and, and the police out there? In California? Yeah. No. 
is anything in information that could be of help to us in law enforcement. Now I want to ask you a question. Uh, whether or not it's true that the Hell's Angels provide security for entertainers at rock concerts? Yes, they do. Uh, why do they do that? Uh, Are the Hell's Angels paid for that, or, uh, or are they interested in some of the entertainers? Or, uh, for just yes, what there's a f three entertainers that uh, have uh, Hell's Angels on their payroll. There's one that has two of them are his bodyguards, and there's another one that works for him. There's three all together that travel with him all the time. And uh, the other two, one has, uh, this other band has uh, Hells Angel that works for them too. He travels with them. And plus they also regulate who works for them. Uh, and then there's another entertainer that uh, at each concert, whenever he's in a town where there's a charter of Hells Angels, there's an open, open invitation for him to come out and come behind the stage and everything, and then uh, usually they go to a motel and do drugs. Well, what, uh, what do they get out of uh, giving protection to these uh, rock concert entertainers? Do they get money? Do they get sex? Or just yes. what do they get? They get... Uh, The one entertainer uh, that has the three working for him is furnished with, uh, with uh, drugs. Uh, they also have his concessions. Uh, these are Oakland members. They have his uh, T-shirt concessions and uh, things like that. And they travel around with five girls, four or five girls they have that uh, set up these booths at these different concerts selling T-shirts. Uh, different paraphernalia from the concert, posters, things like that, which a piece of the proceeds goes back to the, to the Oakland Charter from these members. And what percentage? I don't know the percentage. I just know that a piece of it goes back to the thing. You spoke about the girls selling T-shirts and so forth. Did mm -hmm. they sell anything else? Yes, and then there's, there's an open uh, invitation to any charter of Hells Angels that want to throw like a rock concert or something, they have to pay the charters in California fifty thousand uh, dollars to uh, have one of these entertainers to to appear at one of their concerts. Say if Cleveland wanted to throw a concert, they would have to pay uh, Oakland or Richmond. Pay who? Pay Oakland, California Charter Hell's Angels or Richmond, California Hell's Angels fifty thousand dollars in order to throw that concert. Why well, would have to pay them to give them protection for some reason? Uh, no, they just, uh, they... Uh, You're tied in with them? It's more or like a tribute to them. Huh? It's more or less like a tribute to uh, these different charters. In other words, uh, they just pay them tribute because if they didn't pay it, Hell's Angels would give them trouble? Yes, they wouldn't let these other charters use these, these different bands for these, uh, for these uh, concerts. Well, do you know of any Hell's Angels that have turned against the rock stars? Yes. Can I name all the stars? There's one, it's one incident that I'm aware of. Uh, that happened uh, over a killing at a concert. And this one band, uh, the club felt that the band didn't stand behind them. They had hired them to do now, security work. When you work. speak of a band, now what do you mean by a band? This rock band, this one specific rock band that I'm talking about. They had thrown a concert and someone was killed there. Well, 
they felt that this rock club should have stayed behind them and, and uh, said that they had hired them for security around the, band, around the bandstand or whatever, but they didn't, they just left. And it's always been a thorn in the side of Oakland and a lot of the charters and a lot of clubs. So there's always been more or less an open contract, open contract on this, this band and this person. And there's been two attempts that I know of that failed. Two attempts at what? To kill him. One to kill the rock concert man. Yeah, one was. Well, did they ever kill him? No, no, and they, but they will someday. They, that's. Uh, they will someday. They. They, yeah. This is he's. Uh, the he's a target. That, yes, yes. I won't ask his name in public. We may want to ask him executive session. Unless you want to disclose his name now, if you want to disclose it now. It's Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. It's from the Altamont thing. Uh, one charter. You might tell us more about the attempts on his life. Uh, I was in this charter, I was in this town where this charter is, in New York, in the city, and uh, this had been discussed many a time, many a time about uh, killing him, killing the band for that. And uh, people want to do it uh, to get in good grace with California. Whoever does it, it's, it's quite a trophy for him or whatever. There's a lot of hate there too. Uh, to the to the extent that no hell's angel will listen to uh, Mick Jagger's music, well, uh, one one attempt was made where they sent a member with a gun and a silencer to a hotel, and uh, he stalked that hotel for a long time, but they didn't show up. And then the next attempt was a few years later, somewhere around '79, where '79 uh, or '80. Somewhere around in there, when they were uh, in New York City for a concert or something, they had some place near water, and I was told that they took. They were explaining to me how they did it. They had swam over and checked the place out at some house near water or something, and they was going to put a bomb up underneath it, and they were going to blow the whole band and everybody in the party up. And they were crossing there, and uh, they had a pontoon boat, and a little rubber raft thing with uh, plastic explosives in it and they lost it in the water. That's how it came up because uh, they had got in trouble with uh, some intelligence officers from Cleveland and all because they had, uh, they had lost some, they had lost a big amount of plastics for TCB. And that was, uh, it was a large amount of plastics. And they had described to me how much trouble they had went to set this all up and everything, but they'd failed, but they swore they'd still do it. They'd get him sooner or later. Like I said before, they is he seen. under any protection now? Do you know? No, I don't think so. Let's move on. Now. now, what steps are undertaken by the Hell's Angels before they go on a run? Well, that's the job of security, and it's usually uh, run committee. That's a member or two members from each charter. Runs were held in Cody, Wyoming. Runs were held up in Yankton, near Yankton, Wyoming. Runs were held down in North Carolina. I'd been on a couple of those runs as run committee. Two members are usually sent out from each charter to go out as a run committee, and that's to help with the food and all the secure of the area and everything. And intelligence sends out, and security, send, well, security sends out two people, and they go with, uh, they take all the electronic equipment out. They take uh, booby traps. They've had booby traps around, around the camp. They've had uh, shotgun mics where you could just point it at a car that's sitting way away and listen to whatever somebody was saying or point it at their face. They got uh, twilight scopes to where they can see in the dark or by starlight. Uh, they have uh, FM radios. 
that they have their own uh, they have their own uh, crystals installed in them. In fact, they sent to Washington and got a chart of all the FM frequencies, and then from that chart they could figure out which government agent is on agency is on which frequencies, and uh, they got frequencies that would fit in between where no one is using uh, these different frequencies, so they're all on their own channel. And uh, they set up, first the bond committee and the, uh, and the security people set up and secure the whole area for a good mile all the way around it in the highest point or whatever. They set up uh, different command posts all the way around it, which would be maybe six, seven that's manned by prospects when they get there. And it's manned by a member, a member and a prospect all the way around. And uh, they're all equipped with guns, silencers. And uh, they're all in touch with each other through radios. Mostly they use CBs around from those, those command posts. And they have a car running up down the road. Then when each pack leaves from their home place or whatever, sometimes two or three charters will get together and say in Cleveland, ride out to Yankton or ride out to, uh, to Cody or whatever. There'll be uh, whoever's up front will have one of the FM radios. Somebody in the back will have a mobile FM. And then there'll be a chase car. And the chase car will have automatic weapons in it. And it'll be a fast car following the pack. And there's usually a van. And uh, they carry uh, the van, usually up under the van or the chase car, they'll have plates welded up under it for boxes to be installed, for uh, to carry plastics, to carry grenades, to carry any kind of uh, weaponry. And uh, they set up a whole secure area there. And they guard the packs going out. Now, wouldn't automobiles be a better method of transportation to accomplish their goals rather than motorcycles? Well, that's probably in the future because they're down to only about one or two runs a year now because of the war. The war stopped on a lot of their freedom of moving around on bikes and everything, which contributed to a lot of them cleaning up. They're not, uh, they're not the same as they used to be, greasy, dirty, long hair and everything else. It's not, uh, it's not uncommon to see somebody with a three-piece suit now. You think they are converting from a situation where they had a more significant appearance to the public to a situation now where they have become more secretive and organized for operations? They became secret and organized way back eight, nine years ago. They've perfected it over the years. They've perfected, they perfected their killing skills. They've perfected their in intelligence. They've perfected uh, everything. That's all they've spent their time. It's, it's a constant thing. Each, each church, it's a constant thing. Somebody has a new idea of how to, how to perfect uh, security or how to, how to bug a telephone better or how to uh, bug somebody. Uh, for instance, they bought uh, two dozen of those little $6 bugging devices where you, you set them down. They got a little long wire on them and you turn your radio on to channel FM on 93. Well, they'd go into motorcycle shops that were frequented by outlaws and they would let it be known that they were Hell's Angels by wearing their patches in there and they would leave these things on the counter or around close to wherever the, the clerk or whatever would be and then they'd go outside and listen to what he had to say so that they could uh, figure out, you know, like once it was said that, uh, well, they had made a phone call and there was a couple outlaws on their way down there, you know, to find out about it or whatever. So they what knew is how to it, set them up. <clears throat> what is the goal in life of the Hells Angels? Is it chiefly to rob, to, to obtain uh, money without waking? Or is it chiefly for thrills? Is it chiefly to conduct prostitution? Or, or chiefly for sex? What is their goal in life? Well, Why do they exist? Well, they exist. They celebrate 1947, March is their anniversary date. Up till What's that date again? March of 47. And uh, 
they celebrate that date, you say? Yes. Is that Is the there, date they were inaugurated, the date yes, they began they operations? Out. Yes, it's an old club. Uh, in the early 60s, 59 or so, it was a lot of things were changed, and a lot of it was a new patch drawn up. Stabbed to death. One Hell's Angel was stabbed to death. Uh, 28 breed were stabbed, cut to pieces, uh, and went to hospitals and things. And uh, I was stabbed four times. Uh, supposedly there were seven breed killed there, but uh, after that, things uh, that war there was what really started it. We declared war on the breed, and uh, there was a lot of, that's where intelligence, all of that kind of started originating. And uh, they started setting up intelligence security hits, and uh, we stopped that club. There's uh, very few, but they, they, don't, they don't show themselves at runs or anything like that anymore. Uh, there's no charters in Cleveland, there's no charters uh, in Ohio, or there's no charters in PA or anything like that anymore. And uh, then uh, the outlaw war came along, and then it was perfected more and more then. And it kind of got away from the brotherhood thing. Uh, it was killings. Every church people were being brought up for not going out and doing their thing. No TCB in. And what did you say about church? At church, people, churches, which uh, call a weekly meeting. That meeting is called a church, church. meeting. Yes, sir. Call it church. Yes, sir. And uh, there was always somebody on the carpet for not uh, going at TCB. And intelligence had all the records on who would go out and do different things. Uh, they were brought up on the when carpet. When they directed what they were to do, yes, they were. Well, they were told assignments. Yes. Well, could they refuse those assignments if they wanted to, or asked to swap for some other assignment, or, or did they have to carry out the assignment? They had to have a good it? reason. How's that? They had to have a good reason. Or, um, or carry it out. Or carry, yeah. Um, they, uh, and the killings just kind of got out of hand. There was. Uh, It was women and children killed. Women and children were killed? Yes. Well, why were they killed? Uh, why would they kill women and children? They were killed by, along with outlaws. Along what? With outlaws. Accidentally or intentionally? Uh, Senator, there's some pending uh, litigation in Cleveland at this time regarding uh, the particular incident that the witness is alluding to. So uh, if we would ask uh, the senator's permission not to answer that particular question. That'd be all right. Uh, we withdraw that question. Now, what is the difference between the membership recruitment techniques used by the Hells Angels as opposed to that laws? Would you repeat that, please? Now, what's you the difference that? in the recruitment techniques? Oh, the, the recruitment Angels techniques? And the outlaws, the outlaws, I'm very familiar with the outlaws. From, I've traveled a lot. I know a lot of them. Spent time with them. They, uh, they're known to go into a town where there's a small club there and uh, enforce them to put the outlaw patch on. Tell them, uh, either you're going to be an outlaw or you're going to be nothing. And they'll force that patch onto them. And uh, as were the Hells Angels, wait for the different clubs to come to them and, uh, and work at it from there. A uh, club will come and it has to be uh, sponsored. If it's in the same state, it don't, the, if it's in a state where a charter is, that charter can allow them to have a charter, can establish a charter in another town in their own state. But if it's from another state where there's no charter, well then the whole East Coast would have to vote on it and the West Coast too, at a USA run. They have to uh, come as, as uh, prospects, the whole charter, 
would drop their patch, get a patch with their bottom, just have a bottom rocker that says the town, wherever they're at. There'd be prospects. Outlaw, outlaws are more selective. They would choose their members. No, Hell's Angels uh, are more selective. I mean, the Hell's Angels are yes. more selective. Yes, very but much. The outlaws so. would, would dub somebody a member and, yes. and uh, they could say or not. Yes, then do their weeding. Now, what effect has the RICO statute had on deterring the illegal activities of the motorcycle gangs? The RICO is one thing that uh, everyone is scared of. That's the one law that, uh, that scares all the charters. The whole club as a whole is afraid of it. Because they feel that if uh, one charter goes down, the rest of them will all be indicted too. And that uh, they, there's been a lot of talk over the years, last three, four, five years, well, even before Oakland's RICO, they were scared of conspiracies. And uh, members are told to, to straighten up, get their, try to get their taxes paid, try to, get, uh, try to get some kind of phony paperwork set up so that they can prove that they were working or something. And uh, they, they, there's even uh, incidences where there's companies being paid to pay their income tax and things like that. And uh, Rico, since there's been uh, a couple more, so better angels out here than Richmond. They went down with Rico. There's been a, a couple of motorcycle gangs that's been uh, in, convicted of Rico, which has scared them a lot. Uh, I believe the Confederate Angels out of Richmond. And uh, then there's other incidences where uh, there's clubs that's been convicted of it. It's the only, it's the only really uh, law that uh, that they're scared, that they're really afraid of. And let me ask you. Yeah, they they receive a lot of legal advice on how to avoid uh, prosecution for RICO. Uh, there's a lawyer that advised them there in Cleveland about. Uh, you know, getting their taxes straightened up, getting this, getting that. They've, they've Do the Hells Angels five, have a, a regular employer lawyer, full-time employer lawyer, or, or consultant lawyer in these different places like Florida and Ohio and California, other places? They've had the same lawyer all during the trial in California, I think, which went on for eight months. And that trial went on for eight months or so. And... Uh, then when the RICO hit Omaha, each member was assessed so much money, 250 to send out there. He uh, moved there, two Hells Angels from each charter had to go there at separate times, but there was always two Hells Angels from different charters that would go there and act as his bodyguards and uh, chauffeur whatever to do anything that he wanted done and make sure that the outlaws didn't hit him because Omaha was close to uh, Minnesota. And that's where uh, there's a big stronghold, strang stronghold of outlaws up there. They didn't want the outlaws killing him so that, uh, that they may lose that case there in Omaha. Uh, now, what type of criminal activity is Hell's Angels chapter in Charleston, South Carolina, formerly known as the Tribulators, engaged in? Uh, they, they deal in drugs, women. Uh, Weapons. When you say women, what do you mean by prostitution? Or? Yeah, prostitution, topless dancing. They have a place there called, uh, doesn't belong to them, but it belongs to this woman that they're really close with. And, uh, water. Would you go and tell us about the Charleston situation? That happened to be in my state, and, and I'm very interested in it. Um, well, they have, they have girls. There's a place called the Joker there in... Uh, called what? The Joker in Charleston. The Joker. Yes. It's a topless place. Dance girls. And uh, a lot of their old ladies work there. I think each one of them has an old lady working there. There's, they what? Each one of them has an old lady working there. Some of them have two. And uh, they meet a lot of uh, a lot of the airmen in there, 
from the bases around there. And uh, their old ladies sell a lot of drugs. They do the dancing. Well, is that an entertainment place? Is it a prostitution yes. place or just what no, is it? No, it's a topless place. Huh? It's a topless place. Topless place? Yes. Well, but is it also prostitution? Yeah, their old ladies sell, yeah. Their it's also prostitution. Yeah. Their old ladies turn tricks out there, yes. What? Yes. And uh, what do you call it, turning tricks? Yes, turning tricks. That's prostitution. Uh, they okay, deal in arms. Ahead. They deal in arms through the club. The what? Uh, it's a known fact all through the clubs that that's that we can get arms from down there. There's uh. 45s, grenades, things like that we can get from them, any kind of military uh, weaponry. It was the military weapons? Yes. And where there and they, in Charlotte, too. Where did they get those from? Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly, but I know, they, I know they come from there, but I don't know exactly the persons they get them from. Are the armed Our services person? weapons? Yes. The same yes. weapons used by the armed services? Yes. Yes. Well, are they... Um, Stolen from the armed services, or how did they get them? I presume so, yes. In the same way with Charlotte. Right. In Charlotte, North Carolina, there was a... Uh, Cleveland Charter got uh, three Laws rockets from them that, was, uh, that they had got from military personnel down there. What do you say? I want to ask you this question. Are the Hells Angels involved in child pornography in any way? Uh, not that I know of. I sounds aggressive, especially interested in the question. Uh, could you tell us um, or just how you got your bones? That means how you killed somebody, doesn't it? Yes, sir. I got mine from the Polish Women's Hall. How's that? I got mine from the Polish Women's Hall, from that fight with the breed. They considered that bones for the first, uh, there was only uh, about six of us, six or seven of us that was involved in that. And that dates back to 71. So, and we got the bones, they started the bones thing around uh, Is that the first time you killed somebody? Yes, in that hall, yes. How's that? Yes. 71? Yes. Go yeah. ahead. He had a knife. He had a knife pulling it down in my heart. And I stabbed him. Uh, Explain that. <clears throat> well, when the fight broke out, I started just punching people, and then, uh, there was about these breed. That club was about. It wasn't a very big club, and it didn't have older. It didn't have a lot of older members. But the older members were. I mean, it did have a lot of older members in the breed. They were like 35, 30 ish like that, and they'd been riding together for a while. Well, for that year before that, they started around 1970, they started just building up their numbers real big. They came to Cleveland, they put patches on just about every little Honda rider, kids all over town. And we had heard about it, and a uh, policeman had told us about it. And we'd been putting on this, this bike show there. For two years prior to that, we'd been helping putting on this bike show. And we went to, and we had bikes in there, and we were there, we, we were going to hit them. We found out that uh, we found out that they were all meeting up at this place outside of town. We sent some people out there that we knew, and uh, what the meeting was all about was they said that they were going to come there to that hall and they weren't going to leave till all the Hell's Angels were down, and they were just pushing these egg and these young kids on. All these kids were more or less like anywhere from 18, 19, 20, like that. And uh, so I sent two girls over there, and they found out where the officers were all staying in this one apartment. And I reported back, and they, we decided we, we considered going over there and throwing grenades in the window and just blowing up all the officers and stop it, nip it in the bud. But then uh, 
We said, no, we don't want to do nothing like that. Uh, the police know that they're going to come there to that hall. They, you know, they've been telling us they're not going to let nothing get off. So we went to the hall. We walked in the hall, and uh, we were there maybe uh, an hour, and here they came. It's about 208 of them come marching in the doors, and they all came in, and everybody was shoulder to shoulder, and the fight got off. When the fight got off, I started punching people. I kept hitting this one kid. I hit him once, and I went to somebody else, and I, out of the corner of my eyes, he didn't go down. I turned around and hit him again, and I noticed his eyes was rolling back. And I looked up over his head, and there was an arm coming down with a knife in it, and he stuck me in the chest. And uh, he dropped the kid, and it's this guy, and he was about 35, about bald. And he was grinning, and he was pulling, grabbed me by the shoulder with his left hand, and he had his knife pulling down into my chest over my heart. And uh, his feet was almost off the floor, and he was pulling up on me. He was grinning at me. So uh, I pulled my knife and hit him. And I killed him. That was the first person I ever killed. And uh, when the fight that? went on, and I got stabbed Where again. Where was that? What place? It was a Polish women's hall in 1971, March 7, 1971, in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio. All right. And, uh, yeah. I went on and got stabbed again, and I got stabbed in the back, and I woke up on the floor with my knife sticking in some guy. I spent, uh, they filed uh, four murder charges on us, first degree murder, six cuttings and one riot. And we spent ten months in jail and two years probation for it, for manslaughter. All right, uh, counsel has a few questions. You Did you kill questions? other people that after that one murder? Nobody. Yes. Yes. How many murders have you committed total? One other one. One. Two total. One well, the in one in the hall was self-defense, I felt. But anyway, then there was one more. There was, uh, and they got on my case at church at 74. Now, who is they, if you would? Intelligence and the president. They started screaming oh, hollering. Hell's Angels, you mean? Yes, oh, at a church. They started screaming, you know, that I hadn't done anything, me and another member, that we hadn't done anything towards uh, the outlaws. And uh, so, and I was pretty fired up about Florida anyway. Uh, they. Um, intelligence, they told me, uh, they said they're just going to have to do something. I said, all right, well, I was ready to do something. So they told me to just wait, and uh, intelligence security would set something up. So in a few days, they came by and said, uh, here's a shotgun, cut it down. And I cut down the shotgun. And, you uh, sawed it off? Yes, yeah, cut right. down the barrel, cut down the stock. And then went to... Uh, and waited for a couple more days. They said that they'd come by and pick me up. They had all the information in the place. It was supposed to be an outlaw meeting. And uh, so they came by and picked me up. And uh, I, I was sitting in the front seat. One guy had a machine gun sitting in the back seat. And the other guy had a 45 that was driving. And I never really thought it would go down. We drove down there. They'd already set it up and made the runs on it, I guess, and checked it all out. And they had a car stashed down there another car and uh, we drove down there and it all just took place boom just like that they drove straight to it and there was a bunch of people standing outside and it was dark and uh, we pulled up and stopped and machine gun opened up and I started shooting and uh, I, I shot a window out and I shot a bike and I shot up the driveway and I hit somebody which is more or less why I'm sitting here because it turned out to be a 17-year-old kid, and uh, that was the only other killing I ever did. So you were arrested in conviction for that for that? Yes, murder. I played. Yeah. Right. He's having time. Yeah. He's having time. Yeah. You're saving time for that now, are you? Yes. It was an unsolved murder till I. How's that? It was an unsolved murder till I confessed to it. 
Just to clarify one point, the police in Florida were perfectly well aware that you were there for criminal purposes and that you had a criminal background because you belonged to the Hells Angels. Oh, yes. So there was no misconception on their part that there was a, that you were trying to do good of any way, in any manner. No, we were there to investigate, to find out the, who killed them, uh, and find out as much as we could on the outlaws. Do you have anything else that you want to say uh, to us? Uh, I'm not too sure when I ask you the purpose of the Hell's Angels, just why do they exist? What What was your answer? Could you make a very brief answer? No, I got is it to Is it to rob people so you won't have to wait? It used to be a brotherhood, then they got into so many. So you don't have to wait? Is it to commit other illegal activities so you don't have to wait? Or is it a um, uh, challenge to you to, to do something and try to get away with it? Or just, uh, what is it? purpose of the Hells Angels? And why did you join the Hells Angels? I stayed, I, I joined because of a brotherhood, and I thought it was a good idea. There was a, you know, there's always a lot of theories. Everyone had different theories about, but it was all the same thing, that we were one family, one big family, we're all brotherhood. We would all stay together, and we would all, our kids would be Hells Angels, and this and that. There is some, some members that are 60-something years old, and their kids are Hells Angels now. And uh, that was, you know, it was something that, uh, that we'd all grow old and be proud of, you know, brotherhood, and we'd all help each other. But after we got into the war and then after the senseless killing of women and children numerous times, women and, you know, just getting killed and everything, it just kind of tore it, the whole thing. And then people got into drugs really heavy in the dealing of drugs. They accumulated big money. They had different ideas. After the Godfather movie and everything, it uh, kind of evolved all into just one big uh, organization for profit. And they got away from the brotherhood, the whole thing of it. And, uh, and now uh, it's nothing to kill anybody. There is no fist fighting anymore. If you are in a bar or something like that and just if some drunk jumps on you or something like that or you get mad at somebody, they don't... Each member was assessed $250 to pay to Omaha for the trials there, from the RICO trial. Huh? Nationally? Yeah, nationally, yeah. And Just in the United States, not in Europe or Australia. Okay, and the same question in regard okay. to the Barger trials. Yes, in the, in the Barger trial, each person was assessed, uh, I think it was $100 the first time, but then once they got to sell them the T-shirts and the bumper stickers and all that, it was a... Uh, a full page ad taken out in a mo motorcycle magazine called uh, Easy Rider, which didn't cost us anything. And uh, all the monies from that went into that fund there, that defense, which caused a lot of trouble in the club because they wanted accounting, so how much money it was, but Oakland wouldn't tell them, which I assume, which I've gathered from a lot of hearsay and talk and everything, that it was all, quite a bit of money. They were taking bags each day from the uh, post office. What did to Oakland. Where, where, where did they take the money? To Oakland. Oakland had charge of that completely. Who was it turned over to? Cisco. Uh, is it true that they are beginning to store intelligence information on computer tapes? And if so, what have you personally observed concerning the gang's use of computers for that purpose? Over the years, all that information that people were gathering up was always on little pieces of paper on the back of cards or whatever. And they tried to keep it all together and it just got all out of hand. And in 1980, there's a member in Cleveland who had a motorcycle shop. He had a computer in it. And so it was brought to the church one night, a meeting that uh, the club should fund, you know, fund uh, for the tape. By church, you mean a meeting, meeting yes, of the church. club? Yes, church. Yeah, that's what they call a meeting. The church. term is is church, term. which is every week and it's mandatory. And uh, 
So funds were taken out from the Treasury and, and paid for uh, a tape for uh, the computer to put all this information in a computer, which uh, covered all the other little pieces of paper and everything to centralize everything, plus what members had rolled their bonds and where they had rolled their bonds, every, all the information, every bit of information. Yeah, when you, what's the term rolling your bones mean? Well, a new member, when he joins a club, he has six months which end to roll his bonds to kill someone. Once he gets his patch, he gets his patch and then he has to roll his bones within six months. If he don't roll his bones within six months, he loses his patch. He has to kill someone. And the person he kills is uh, someone that uh, the intelligence will set up with security and they'll set up the hit for him and then he'll be taken to that place to where yeah, it's at this point I think it might be a good opportunity to tell us about the initiation process and uh, all and continuing on then with the total induction into the Hells Angels all right uh, first it's a hang around someone that comes around the club and wants to join the club must have a good mo motorcycle Harley Davidson be white and be uh, 21 or older when he first comes around the club, there's a lot of mud checking. He has to fight a lot of people. A lot of people jump on him. They jump on him in twos, threes. Then uh, after a period of time, which, which depends on the purposes, person, it may be three months, it may be a year, two years, he can become a hang around. Well, in, say three months, six months, or a year, something like that. We'll have a vote, and it has to be a 100% vote that he's allowed to be a hang around. Now, hang around is allowed to come into the clubhouse and hang around on the outside of the clubhouse. They do that to keep everybody else away because uh, a lot of people believe that Hell's Angels are giants and they, uh, they've got everything together. And uh, so they, they keep everybody arm's length away from us, you know, so that they don't really understand that we're just people or whatever. Keep them in awe. And uh, then he becomes a hang around. He can come into the clubhouse and he can do flunky work. And uh, then he's hang around for no set period of time. It depends on the person. Then he becomes a prospect, and he can be brought up for a prospect three times if he's ever if he's voted down three different times. So then they run him off. They beat him up, take his motorcycle, run him away. Same way if he's a hang around if he if he doesn't go through the mud check or whatever, they beat him up, take his motorcycle or whatever, take his old lady, run him off. Well, uh, then. Uh, as a prospect, he's, uh, he's just a general flunky. He uh, carries, the, does the moving, he does everything, cleaning bikes, working on bikes. He's on 24-hour call. There's always a watch at the clubhouse. He stands watch upstairs, and huh? he's armed with, uh, there's carbines, shotguns, there's uh, twilights up there, the scopes, there's scanners, everything. They have a security room in the top of the clubhouse. And uh, he sits there at night from uh, 12 o'clock till daylight. That's the rule there. Some places it's all night and they change prospects. And uh, he's uh, one, one incident where a prospect was down in a bar, got in a fight, and a guy took a shot at him and, and shot him through the side right here. Uh, he was ordered to... Uh, either get this guy and do something to him or lose his patch because uh, he was losing face. The club would be losing face if he didn't do something to this guy. And uh, and being a prospect can carry on. Some people are a prospect for five years. Some people, uh, six months, I think, was the shortest period I ever heard. But normally, it's a year and a half, two years. They have to go all the runs. At the runs, they build a fire. They carry all the firewood. They work 24 hours a day. They're just a monkey, you know, until they get their patch. Yeah. Is, it's at that point where, uh, in order to become a full-fledged member, then they have to have committed a murder? No, they're told that after they get their patch. They're voted on 100%. Then they're pulled into the clubhouse, told that they've been voted on. Now they're a member. And then their sponsor will explain to them that they have to come up with so much money for a bond fund, which is $500. Um, then they'll have to, uh, and that they'll have to roll their bonds. 
and they'll have to kill someone. And if they renege on that, uh, how then they're killed. Okay, how, f oh, you say if the person does not commit a murder, then he is killed? Yes, because then he knows, and he knows okay. too much. Um, what is, how formal or ceremonial is the initiation process? Well, there's usually a big party, a lot of drinking, fighting, just, uh, it's toned down from years before. Uh, years before, it used to be uh, pretty wild. No, not really. Not, uh, it's just he's brought in and everybody gives him a hug and gives him his patch. Because uh, by then, everybody knows each other pretty well. Uh, when is he awarded uh, his colors? When everyone feels that he's ready. When it's a 100% vote. And that's uh, when that has to be uh, done it depends on in, in at least three times or he's out. Right. You can be, yeah. And it has to be a 100% vote. Okay. You, you said that present, present initiation is different than uh, in, in the past. Uh, does that mean that the personal degrade, uh, degrading of the individual is, uh, is no longer a part of the ceremony? Yes, uh, they feel they've grown out of that. It used to be everybody would urinate on them, everybody would throw grease on them, things like that. And they would have to uh, do things to women and all that. Okay. Are there women members? No, uh, no. The m well, you use the fir uh, term old ladies. How does that fit into the total overall uh, picture of the... They have their own uh, marriage ceremony. There's uh, a lot of people that have uh, these uh, religious diplomas from the Uni Unification Church or something like that, and they perform uh, a ceremony. We have a marriage ceremony in the club and uh, we have weddings and uh, but mostly it's reserved for somebody who's been with an old lady for three, four, five years, something like that. But they're old ladies, it's considered if someone's with someone. It's What's the name of the church that you gave? I think it's at Unification Church out of... Um, okay, now how does that relate to the marriage Chicago. ceremony? Or how did you use that term? A lot of the members have, um, have that that certificate from that church that says that they are a, a reverend of that church. And they sell them, there's a few members that are deacons in that church. And it, uh, it was used for uh, a few times I know of to get in jails to see people and uh, things like that. Yeah. Uh, how close to the uh, clubhouse are the uh, <coughs> women that you referred to, whether they're uh, married or unmarried? How close are they? Yeah, you know, physically how close are oh, they to the clubhouse uh, and to the activities it's of the not, club? It's, it's a whole different set of rules for women. They're allowed in the clubhouse all the time. Some, they're, they pick up runaways and pull them in. They're, they're allowed in the clubhouse all the time. There's people uh, pick girls up on the street, hitchhiking and stuff like that, bring them in, keep them around the clubhouse a couple of days. Everybody uses, abuses them, then they run them off. Some that's older, they turn out. You know, what do you mean by turnout? Turnout, prostitution. Tell them to go down to Charlotte or whatever and work down there in the massage parlors. There's been since that. Uh, in uh, Charleston, they got a, a topless place down there where all their old ladies work down there. Some people have two, three old ladies. Uh, California, there's a lot of prostitution. Um, New York, all the old ladies up there work topless bars, sell drugs. That's about the same criteria for everybody all the way across. The money comes back to the gang member or? Yes, it comes back to, to the To him gang. as an individual? Yes, all and of it, all of it. And he provides for her and... Then uh, in your experience as a Hell's Angel, were you aware of any public officials that, that they were able to contact in order to obtain information not normally available to the public? Yes, um, police officers um, in a couple of towns, 
that uh, provide a lot of information on okay. movements of clubs. Right. What position within the towns? Uh, are we talking about elected public officials, appointed yes. public officials, yes, or just public employees? Yes, no, uh, chief all? of police, right? Chief of police, I say. Uh, oh, I see. No, it was police officials. And we want we want to take uh, names in uh, uh, in in uh, closed session, but we would like to have you state the extent to which. Uh, uh, let me turn it over to S Senator Thurman here, and then I'll finish my question from here. Uh, we would like to have a, a, a delineation, the extent. Uh, not the names now, but have that in closed session. But the positions uh, elected, appointed, or whether or an employee uh, relationship, like you said, a police officer, and uh, and to what extent elected officials would be involved from the standpoint of the question I asked. Yes, that was down the line from chief of police down to patrol Okay, but when you talk about elected officials, you know elected officials. Yeah, no elected officials that I know of. Oh. No elected officials that I know of, but uh, numerous police officers and police chiefs and things like that. You have first hand information about the police officials? Yes, I do. Without uh, calling in the names of those policemen, could you tell us just what they did to uh, cooperate or assist the Hells Angels? Yes, uh, there was a telephone installed in the, in the clubhouse, and one police official had uh, this number, and it was called forwarding. This phone was installed in a closet. Speak a little bit loud, speak in your machine. Right. This phone was installed in the, in the closet upstairs. No one was supposed to touch it. It was for the Pacific specific phone calls from this one police official that uh, he would call in case there was uh, any word that he had to give us on uh, indictments or anything that happened, anything that pertained to any club member. Or, uh, and it was, for, it was a call forwarding type thing that you called it and then it went on out to someone else's house, to the president's house. And he had the number and uh, another policeman had the number. And then uh, I had seen a lot of reports during the RICO trial out in California and Oakland. I'd read there was uh, two, possibly three different times that during that trial and that RICO trial, there was folders maybe a half inch thick that came back from Oakland that they, I heard the price was $100,000 that they had to give for this. How's that? They had to give $100,000, that's what I'd heard. They had to give for this report. And this report, on the front of it, had confidential secret for, for official eyes only and all that stamped all over the front of it. And it pertained to all the, it was a report that they had in California on the bike clubs out there. A lot of it was true and a lot of it wasn't. There was some parts in there that, uh, that interested the club a lot, like, uh, parts uh, pertaining to drug deals and things like that, that members usually do that outside after church, after the meetings and all. They'll go outside and arrange drug deals together on the sidewalk where they'll just whisper together because they're afraid that the clubhouses are bugged by uh, law enforcement or whatever. And that, that statement right there kind of got everybody shook because they knew that uh, one member was talking somewhere because that was a true statement. But a lot of it was... Uh, well, a lot of it was true and a lot of it wasn't. It was more or less, uh, it wasn't uh, to the point. And uh, 
Then uh, another incident in Florida, or went down to investigate the killing of two Hells Angels and an ex Hells Angel. The killing of who? Two Hells Angels and an ex Hells Angel back in '74. Well, the club sent me down there to investigate it. Me and another member from uh, New York City. And uh, we went down and investigated it, and uh, we were met by a policeman and taken and shown everything that they had on the case, shown all the autopsies. And uh, we were guarded by policemen. We were shown, uh, shown files on all the outlaw motorcycle riders there. We read all their files and uh, was given their addresses and things. And then uh, they helped us lease a car and, uh, and helped us in the investigation. And after the investigation, <clears throat> Now, are you saying to the committee that um, a policeman in Ohio cooperated with the Hells Angels? Yes. Now, you spoke about um, quite a few. A hundred thousand dollars passing. Where was that? That was in California for those uh, confidential files that, uh, I, 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 from California, and they were prepared by uh, some some committee out there to investigate motorcycle gangs, and and it pertained to that RICO trial and all, it pertained to Hell's Angels and uh, and all the different clubs that was out there. They had patches and pictures and things like that, and it had all the information that they knew about these different clubs and where they were from and things like that, and the information that they had on them, and. Uh, it all pertained to that club, all, to that trial, that RICO trial. And the money was taken from Oakland from the T-shirt sales and the bumper sticker sales money, and it was paid for with that. That was just one of them. I'd seen another one. That I know who of. Wait, who supplied that money? The Hells Angels supplied the money? During the RICO trial, they had a, they had a full page ad, the motorcycle magazine that said uh, free Sonny Barger and they sold t-shirts with this handcuffs and hands on it and they sold bumper stickers and things like that and uh, people sent club, motorcycle clubs all over the country, all over the world sent money to Oakland to this box and uh, that's where they got all their money for that defense fund there and uh, there was lots of money. Well who was all this joined from a fraternal standpoint, a brotherly feeling standpoint? Yes, a brotherly and, um, and as time went on, the Hells Angels began to commit violence. Uh, they, be uh, 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 they became engaged in robberies, prostitution. Now they have a dream. Other illegal activities. Now, uh, have you abandoned the Hells Angels now? Oh, yes. Entirely? Oh, yes, completely. For life? Oh, com yes. You never intend to participate in any activities again sponsored by them? Oh, no. No, no. Oh, no, I can't. I could never get around. To, thank you very much for your testimony. Now we'll have to clear the room for the next witness. So, until we take this witness out and bring in the next one. So everybody move out as fast as you can. <laughs>